Um, this is Sam Piazza interviewing uh, Ms. Nikki Ratliff, the Executive Director of the Humane Society of Carroll County on April 17, 2010. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Where do you live? I live in Mount Airy. And how long have you lived there? Oh, I've lived there since 1976. What made you come to Carroll County, move to Carroll County? Well, actually, I don't live in, Howard, in Carroll County. I live in Howard County, about a half oh. a mile from Carroll County. Oh, okay. And I would live in Carroll County, but it costs too much to relocate. Okay. <laughs> so uh, at any rate, uh, I feel like I live in Carroll County because that's where I spend almost all of my time. And, um, and I came to the Carroll County Humane Society because there was a, an opportunity there that I just could not pass up. Now, was your education, uh, did you go, go get a degree, degree in, in a, uh, a certain field that would make you want to go into animal? Uh... No, it's just from the time I hatched, I loved animals. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, I was a government contract administrator for an industrial textile mill for many years. And, uh, and then uh, started working with animals when uh, I actually uh, decided to change, just change jobs. And, and I've always wanted to work with animals, and I started doing that. And then I came to uh, humane work sometime after that. Now, when you say you always work with animals, did you volunteer at places before you became the executive director? Well, I had, ho I had a horse. I had several horses, but one particular that I showed. I had my own animals, and so I just uh, rescued my first animal when I was in the fourth grade. It was a chicken that escaped from a, a processing plant, and I snatched it and outran the workers and got the chicken <laughs> home. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then this job came up for the executive director and you applied for it? I did. I did. I uh, had been doing some work in Howard County uh, with large animals uh, with regards to uh, doing uh, uh, abuse investigations with those and met uh, some people that were on the board at the Humane Society in Carroll County and just touched base with them a couple of times a year just to see how things were going. And I touched base one day and they were looking for somebody to be in charge of their facility and their organization. And uh, I said, well, gee, can I apply? And I did, and I got the job. So it was great. When was that? Uh, that was in uh, 1982. Now you said you were doing abuse investigations. Was that a, just a volunteer? Uh... Well, it had come to my attention and others that at that particular time, Howard County Animal Control was only doing dogs, basically. And uh, there was a lot of issues with, uh, with other animals. And so I and uh, an attorney friend of mine uh, and someone else who had some means, we got together and uh, formed the Howard County Large Animal Rescue. So we started uh, uh, looking into those issues. And um, I just kind of operated out of my home for free. I was working. I had another job, but this was just on the side. And uh, the one with uh, a little bit of money in the organization paid for my babysitting fees. <laughs> so I, and then I had the telephone that was paid by the organization in my uh, guest bedroom. So it was kind of a one-horse stop, so to speak. But I did that for a couple of years. And then I think uh, Howard County Animal Control said, gee, you know, we really probably ought to start doing this. And they did. And the moment they started it, I backed right out. Okay. Yeah. What is the responsibility of the executive director of the Humane Society? Well, of course, you're working for a board of directors, and uh, your responsibility is to them. Um, and uh, your responsibility is to hire and fire everyone who works at the Humane Society. And I emphasize the hire and minimize the fire because I hate that. Uh, I certainly will do it if necessary, but I have not had to do that. I, I think my claim to fame has been picking out good people through the years. And, uh, and of course, the executive director gets all the accolades, of, oh, way to go, it's such a great place, and you do such good work. Well, the bottom line is I don't do the work. I pick the people that can do the work, and they're, they're terrific people. And what, what is the Humane Society? Because I'm, I'm sure that the public may not understand exactly what it is. Well, Humane Societies historically uh, were citizens, groups of citizens that got together and then incorporated uh, so they would not have to pay taxes on things that they would buy, dog food and, and supplies. And uh, their whole mission was to make the lives of animals better, uh, to have a place to put animals where they didn't have homes, uh, have a place for animals so that if them, they could come and find them and have a place for people to come and find animals if they wanted to adopt them. And, uh, and then, of course, on the aside, uh, a lot of humane organizations, especially in the older days, used to do cruelty investigations, ne neglect investigations, and check into things like that. Uh, we do that continually here in Carroll County because we have a memorandum of understanding with the county government to run their animal care and control program. So we do continue to investigate abuse situations, whereas some little humane societies who don't have that relationship anymore, they may choose not to from liability standpoint, insurance standpoints, and things have gotten so much more sophisticated than the old days when you would go out. So, you know, it's better off now leaving it to people that have the means. And I, I want to get to those uh, various 
purposes in a minute. What is generally the mission of the Humane Society? Well, the mission of the Humane Society is to educate the public on the, the needs of the, of the animals that they have, to educate the public on the reasons why they should have, animals should have shade, shelter, protection from the weather, uh, to house the abused and abandoned, uh, to make the, just generally make the lives of animals better, and to assist the citizens, uh, you know, with their issues with animals. How are you funded? Well, we have private donations which come in, uh, everything from uh, $10 every week to some people will give more and some people will leave money in their estates occasionally. Uh, but the bulk of the money uh, is through the county government uh, because the bulk of what we do is uh, the same thing they would do if they were running an animal care control facility themselves. How big of a staff do you have? I have, uh, there are 12 of us that are full-time and two part-time. Um, and it's a very small staff compared to other jurisdictions uh, handling basically the same type of work. Do you also have an active volunteer staff? We have some, which, but you know, it's been my experience that while volunteers are absolutely wonderful, then uh, they are absolutely the icing on the cake. Uh, if you have your entire program, uh, especially for an animal care and control program where there are expectations that need to be met, you can't rely on volunteers. So you have to have a staff that's capable of handling the day-to-day. -day. And then um, the volunteers are just help my staff immeasurably. Where are, you the, where are you located? We're uh, off of Littlestown Pike, about four miles outside of Westminster, uh, 2517 Littlestown Pike, uh, before you get to Union Mills after you pass the airport. And you have a website. So, so we do. We do have a website. A, if you can give us your website. Oh, you're really putting me on the spot here. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. It's www.carr. You know, I'm not going to be able to give it to you because I, I just never articulate the website. Isn't that awful? But all you have to do is put, put it in. Humane historic. Society of Carroll County, and you'll get it. You'll and get we're it. on Facebook, and so you can always get it. I'm going to try to break down I, I, the three areas that, uh, and you can correct me, that are the main purposes of the Humane Society, adoption, education, and enforcement. Mm -hmm. Does that pretty sound, sound pretty, pretty much, much what I you do? I think that's probably pretty good. So th let's talk about the adoption part of it. Uh, what types of animals do you take in? Everything that's not human. Everything that's not human. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have children you want to put off, I understand that. There was a point in time when I would have dropped mine off too, but we won't take them. <laughs> uh, everything from, we've had everything from scorpions to uh, um, cows and horses and goats and pigs um, in terms of for adoption. Um, if uh, you're talking about how, what have we had at the facility, uh, uh, the most exotic animal we had was a jaguar for a while. Uh, but that wasn't for adoption. <laughs> <laughs> but you actually uh, went ahead and took the Jaguar? We did. Uh, the Jaguar was being housed illegally in the state of Maryland, and uh, the Department of Natural Resources had gotten involved with it, and they asked if we could house it for them, and we did. Okay. Now, had that been a wild Jaguar, uh, dog kennels would not have sufficed. <laughs> but since it was a captive Jaguar, it was fine in the kennel. Well, someone wants to come into the, his, the Humane Society and wants to adopt, adopt an animal. Mm -hmm. Walk me through the process of how that works. Well, you would come into the Humane Society, and, and, and would now with the website, you would be able to go and see what was available for adoption, which is nice. And, uh, and then you would come to the Humane Society and ask to see the animal. We have a bulletin board that gives you the uh, uh, parameters of, for adoption and uh, the prices involved with adoption. And, uh, and then you go back and meet with the animal and come back out and talk with the staff. Because we want to make sure that you are, sh are sure of the animal that you're adopting and what is best for you. Because if you're a couch potato, you might not want a, two, a, 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 a six month old Jack Russell Terrier, you know? So we want to make sure your expectations are going to be somewhat met. Uh, if you've got really small children, um, then we're probably going to discourage you from taking the three year old Rottweiler in the back just because we think he's friendly, we think he's nice, but we don't have have kids to test them on, and uh, and children uh, are not predictable in the way they're going to behave around animals, so you're better off getting animals that are probably the best bet, so to speak. And if we really and truly think that this is not a good match and it, it, that for whatever reason it isn't going to work out, certainly we have the right of refusal, just because they're our animals. But we don't normally do that. Normally people are very appreciative when we try and guide them through the system. Once you've decided that you want the animal and if you own your own home, then the adoption process goes pretty quickly. Uh, if you uh, are renting, uh, we ask that you have a landlord's approval. Uh, if you are living home with your mom and dad or someone else who owns the home, uh, we want to make sure whoever owns that residence is giving approval because the animals are required to be inside animals. 
So you can't just take them and chain them up in the backyard. So we need to have landlord approval. Yeah, are there ever concerns that someone might be wanting to have dogs to, for dog fighting purposes or that type of thing? No, because there's so many free dogs out there for that. They probably wouldn't come and try to adopt one from us. And it is a, a law in Carroll County that all animals adopted from the Humane Society have to be spayed and neutered. Um, failure to do so could result in fines up to $500 and 30 days in jail. So, and the idea, of course, is taxpayers don't want to keep paying for more and more animals being housed, and people who love animals don't want to see more and more homeless animals, and so it works really well. So somebody who wanted to fight dogs, they wouldn't come in and adopt a dog from us. How many animals do, do you uh, adopt out every year? Uh, last year we adopted out uh, 1,256, I think. And that also includes animals that have gone to uh, specific rescue groups. Like if we get in a ton of guinea pigs, all of a sudden, well, guinea pig rescue is right there to help us out, or rabbit rescue, or lab rescue, or German shepherd rescue. Uh, we do not call the rescues automatically because they are so full. Uh, and we can adopt uh, because of our web presence and because of the email we send out to all the county computers every day and alerting of the animals for adoption. They, in turn, send that out to their friends on their list. So we adopt out pretty, pretty heavily and, uh, and, and are even able to help out the Adams County Humane Society on occasion with their dogs. Uh, sometimes they'll get so full they have to euthanize for space. And at the same time, maybe all of a sudden we're down to like three or four dogs. And so we serve the community by having more dogs available for the community to adopt, you know, so they don't have to travel. And uh, we help Adams County, and they're real close, uh, so that they don't have to kill animals because they don't have any space. So we kind of work with them on that. And other than your website, you also have critter chat chatter that you do on a weekly basis. We well, we have a, a pet of the week, we, uh, pet of the week, pet, uh, best pals that we do on a weekly basis. And uh, critter chatter was just a show that we had that was has been discontinued now, only because I just ran out of things to have shows about after several, you know, three or four years. You you tend to run out of topics. Now, when you sit down and, and uh, talk to. Uh, potential adoptees of, of an animal do you I mean do you counsel them as to the fact this is not a you're not adopting a toy this is a, you know, a lifelong commitment type of thing or what, what do you talk to them about well I of course don't do that my staff does Your staff, and, yes. and they, they they do discuss those things with them uh, they just discuss life in general their, their, their lives well, what's going on what their expectations are and the animal that they're adopting you know and uh, and and make sure that it's a good match so they do talk about those things uh, we give out an adoption packet with each animal that has information uh, about housebreaking and training and we give out we give out actually a a DVD video uh, about interesting aspects of animals and how to work with them and problems to be solved. So they leave with a lot of information and a lot of things to be able to uh, to make that adoption successful. Are you available for follow phone calls from from new? Adopters? Oh yeah, if, if anybody needs to call us about anything, we're always available for that. Do you suspend adoption around the Christmas holidays? You know, they used to do that in the old days, and uh, and but people have evolved. Citizens have evolved. Their awareness has evolved. And people pretty much now uh, are pretty responsible when they come. So, you know, we don't see animals being returned after Christmas. We kind of gradually went, we went, we went from not adopting anything two weeks before Christmas uh, to not adopting anything under nine months before Christmas to <laughs> now we just adopt. So it, it, we found out that we, we don't get returns any more than any other time. And we encourage people to return an animal to us if it doesn't work out. The last thing we want is for not to have a happy situation. And, and when people, sometimes they might want to feel bad bringing it back, but they should never feel bad because this is something, I would bring an animal back if it didn't work out, if I'd given it my best shot. And everybody's best shot is dependent on their time frame and their availability to that animal, and, and I understand that. But when somebody brings an animal back to us, us and fill and fills out a questionnaire. We know so much more about the animal then than we did before, and that will help us rehome it in an even better situation. So, well, they may, then let me ask you this: They may be concerned that you won't adopt an animal out to, to them in the future. Is that is no? That, that's not nothing, a, no. The two have nothing to do not, with one another. Not at all. Nothing at all. Uh, now, Easter just happened. Did you have a, a number of people <laughs> turning in little ducklings to well, you, you after know, Easter? Some of, the, some of the pet stores and places around, they sell these animals at Easter, and I wish they wouldn't. And yes, we do get them. You know, people decide, wow, that wasn't a real cool thing to do. And uh, But we don't get them in droves. 
you know, a lot of times we feel like we're in the middle of a MasterCard commercial at work because we have all these rabbits. And, uh, and of course, you know, rabbits don't make ideal pets. Uh, for certain people, they do. Uh, and that's the whole deal with animals. I mean, you know, you see things like you see a cockatoo and you see it talking to somebody and you think, oh, my God, that's a wonderful animal. Wouldn't I love to have that? No, you probably really wouldn't because they, uh, they are extremely needy. Uh, they are flock animals, and so they want to be with you constantly. And, it, and, and I mean constantly. I don't mean an hour a day. I mean in your face every minute you're home. And if you don't have them, they start feeding and pulling out the So you have a, a bird that looks like it's ready for the oven. I mean, you know, it's just ridiculous. And, uh, and then they're upset about it, and then nobody wants it because it's ugly, and now it's into a, a habitual picking out its feathers and stuff. And so it's, it's a nightmare. Big birds should not be pets. That being said, there are a few people around that were willing to dedicate their lives, my sister being one of them, uh, to a bird. And it's got all its feathers and it's happy, but, you know, she is really restrained from things. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, not a, it's not a great situation. So, anyway, the, so people need to know what they're getting into. What are the laws of, uh, about about uh, selling these little ducklings and that type of thing? Well, if you sell the ducklings, there the law basically is that you can't sell them as pets. You have to sell them in, in, in groups uh, that would would lend. In other words, if you want a bunch of if you want chickens to lay eggs, then you can certainly go and buy chickens to lay eggs. But anybody that wants chickens to lay eggs is not going to go and get one little peep. And so uh, the law says you can't color them anymore, which is wonderful because who could resist a little red peep. <laughs> I mean, you know, and the law says you can't sell them uh, on an individual uh, basis if they don't have their pen feathers. And once they start to get their pen feathers, they look like a chicken. And then, of course, all of a sudden, people may not want them, just not as readily as they would little peeps. But yeah, you can buy them. Let's talk about the education component uh, of, of, of the Humane Society. Can you just go through what the education component of what you do? Well, we don't have a standing... Uh, individual who goes out to schools and, and talks. Uh, we don't have the funding for that. And, you know, it's an amazing thing. I, I, we had some part-time people that were doing it, but what happens was your part-time person would have all these schools booked in, and then they would quit. <laughs> and ta-da, that meant I had to make those appointments. And, uh, and that's just about an impossible situation. Uh, it's very difficult to have a, a full-time education component. So we focus our, uh, if you watch Pet of the Week, there's usually something people are telling you at that point about the pets. Uh, we're there on telephone to talk and counsel to people. I do still go out and make appearances at clubs and neighborhood associations and things myself. Um, but, you know, in terms of an ongoing situation, we really don't have one. Just don't, just don't have the funding for it. And like I said, even if you've got a volunteer, that's fine. But then you have all these expectations when they book all these different events. And then for whatever reason, they get sick or they quit or disappear, and there you are. So it's kind of, it's kind of tough. Now, the enforcement part of it, and, and that's, that well, probably ties up a great deal of your time. It, well, it does. It does. And, but the enforcement part of it is also the education part of it. Because yeah. uh, I don't expect my officers to go out and just go, gee, you don't have this, this, and this. Here's a citation. Goodbye. <laughs> they need to be able to talk to people. And most people are amenable to that. Uh, education is, is a first and foremost in our thought process. So when the officers get out there and the animal doesn't have the proper food, shelter, water, or whatever, then you want to talk to the individuals. You want to let them know about the law. You want to let them know why the law is in existence. You want to ask them the correct situation. End of story. Uh, they don't want to do it. They will not do it. They do it again next year then the enforcement comes in. So that education is not only through the front office staff, myself, but the officers are doing that too. How many enforcement officers do you have? I have three that are in the field all the time. That's if everybody's well and, a, and everybody's here and everybody's employed and so forth. And then I have a chief officer that's in-house most of the time, fielding questions from the public, doing things in, inside the organization, reading over the other officers' reports, correcting them, sending them back or not. Um, um, Check. He's just there for a whole lot of reasons. And then he's also on special assignment for special cases that when officers need help, uh, maybe they need uh, more expertise, um, he's there available to them too. So just, just walk me through, what exactly do the enforcement officers do in the public? The public has a problem with their neighbor's dog barking all the time. Is that something they call you about? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the, the law basically says that pe people can't be deprived of their use and enjoyment of their properties. Uh, but that being said, uh, there are 
what, what would a reasonable person be expected to tolerate? I mean, nobody says you have to have barkless dogs. Uh, so uh, just because the dog barks for five minutes at two o'clock in the morning, that's not didn't really rise to the occasion of, of, of being a nuisance. Uh, if it barks at five o'clock and 3.15 and 12 o'clock and it's keeping you up all night, then that's a whole other story. Um, and, it, it, and it doesn't just say at night. The law implies this 24 hours a day because some people do work at night and so they sleep during the day. Um, some people are not well or some people just don't want to have to deal with dogs. So we get the people call us and then the front office staff are our dispatchers. They're our front office staff. They feel the call. If the people have never called before, we've never had complaints before, then they will initiate a letter out to the individual who owns the dog. See what you can do about it. Uh, after that, if we get more complaints, then that will be an officer will respond. And then he'll go out and take the appropriate action, talk to the individual. Well, a lot of times when the officer shows up, then the individual goes, oh, well, I guess this is a little more serious than I thought, you know. And then sometimes they'll take corrective actions. But unfortunately today, people are not always good neighbors. I mean, you know, somebody comes to you and me, uh, I'm assuming you and I know me, and they say I'm disturbing or bothering them. I'm like, oh, geez, I mean, I'm sorry. What can I do to mitigate this, you know? Um, and uh, But that's not the way everybody feels today. Uh, there are a lot of make-me's out there. Make me do it. How are you going to you know? And so dog bark even after you do that. Well, you know, so we ask people to keep t uh, dates and times. Uh, on this date, when, times and duration, so that we can make an assessment. Because let's face it, the courts and the state's attorney's offices, they're busy. They don't want to have a barking dog in there. There's just a barking dog. So we, we, can, we, issue, we can issue a citation. Uh, each day is a different violation. The citations escalate. You can pay it if you want to because it's a civil citation. If you choose not to pay it, then in Carroll County, any infraction of the animal code is then a statement of charges is issued, and that barking dog civil citation turns into a full-blown criminal case. So if, if your barking dog uh, is so important to you that you want to have a criminal record uh, as, as opposed to taking care of the situation, well, wow, you know, I can't believe that, but there, that's the avenue for a barking dog. Explain the leash laws. There are no leash laws. I can explain that real quick. There's no leash laws in Carroll County. Uh, the law in Carroll County says that your dog has to be under restraint at all times. And if your dog is in your yard, it is not coming outside of your yard. And if you've chosen to have a margarita in Tijuana and you're not even in the state, as long as your dog is in your yard, it's under restraint. Now, when the dog leaves your property, it had better go with you because it has to be under the control of a responsible person and obedient to that person's commands. So it has to be under effective control. So if you're walking your dog on a flexi leash and the dog races out on its 16 foot leash and knocks somebody down or knocks them off their bicycle or jumps up on them, it's on a leash and it is not under effective control. Uh, if your dog is out there walking with you off leash and somebody's coming on a skateboard past you and your dog's away from you and you say, come here, heal. That dog comes back and it heals, it is under effective control. So, no leash law, but you have to have it under effective control. I'm sure you get a lot of complaints about dogs defecating other people's properties. Yep, and that's illegal. After an individual has asked them to pick it up. Prior to that, it is not. So you have to say to somebody, you know, Joe, I really like your dog, but I'm really tired of stepping in his poo in my yard. And if at that point he doesn't uh, pick it up, uh, then he's in violation of the law. By the same token, Joe's got a big dog, big poo in your yard. <laughs> you always see Joe's dog running loose, but you didn't see him deposit the poo in your yard. Then we're not doing DNA tests on this stuff. So you're going to have to know if that was the dog. You can't just complain. Now, that's a problem with cats. Mrs. Smith's cat's always loose. Well, was Mrs. Smith's cat really the one in your flower bed? You know, that type of thing. So uh, people have to be able to, this is serious when you have laws against things. Uh, and people, you know, and we, we always ask people to practice the good neighbor policy. Speak to your neighbors before you call us. Now, yeah, they're going to be mad when you call us, but they're going to be madder if you call us and they didn't ask them to do something first. And you do, you do accept anonymous phone calls? We do on uh, cruelty, absolutely, but on uh, dogs running loose, no, not going to take anonymous phone calls. That's just too easy to do that. You know, unaccountable, just make a complaint on your neighbor. You, he was out there last night working on his car till late, so I'll just get him, you know. I, we're not going to do that. And, and those are, uh, uh, and the names of the people complaining are available. Upon written request to my office, you can find out who complained on you. It's not an anonymous situation. What animals have to be licensed? Dogs. Only dogs? Only dogs. Now, uh, dogs have to be licensed, and in order to be licensed, they have to have a current rabies shot. Uh, dogs, cats, and ferrets have to have a current rabies shot under state law. 
and then the state law says dogs must be licensed, and it has each county enforcing that portion of the state law. So you enforce that in Carroll County? That's right. County. Mm -hmm. And they have to be licensed on an annual basis? That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you, do you sell the licenses? or? Uh, we not? are responsible for the licensing program as part of our MOU with the county. Uh, we have a licensing outlet in like 30 places in the county. You don't have to drive any distance at all to get a license. Every town office sells them. Almost, almost every veterinary hospital sells them. Uh, several small stores sell them, like Eagle Jewelers in Mount Airy, although I hear that he's going out of business, so we'll have to find somebody else. But uh, we have different stores. So the idea was to make it really accessible to the public so that they didn't have to go too far. And some places are open in the evening. So, yeah. And so we distribute the licensings and the applications, and we pick them up, and we do the money counting, and we turn all that money back into the county government. An, anim an animal gets uh, killed on the road. Wild. Let's take a wild animal versus mm -hmm. domestic animals. Mm -hmm. That's something that you road may society. Road, you may say has nothing to do with wild an uh, uh, dead animals. Okay. If they're dead, they don't need controlling. So we're animal care and control. <laughs> so the roads department, if it's county road, it's county roads. State roads, it's state roads. And those people, uh, I, for certain, the ones in the county, I think the state as well, if they have any kind of identification in the collar or anything, they let us know. So you can inform the owners of the animal? Yeah, it's nice to have closure. You know, okay. it's nice to have closure. I can't guarantee you that they're all doing that, but I think they are. I think they're pretty good about that. Is, is there a problem in, in Carroll County of, do of uh, dog fighting or cock fighting, that type of thing? Well, in the old days when I first came here, there was some cockfighting. I don't—I haven't heard anything about that recently. People are just generally so enlightened uh, today that if there's something like that going on, you hear about it pretty quick, uh, and we will take that anonymously. Um, the um, dog fighting, there, I don't think there's. I don't. Of course, I don't think there are any organized dog fighting rings in Carroll County. Are there young men, and hopefully not women, I hope they got better sense than that, but uh, are there young men with uh, pit bulls that face off periodically? Oh, probably. But not any major dog fighting rings. But that would be something that your officers would enforce? Absolutely. That's a felony statute in the state of Maryland. Dog fighting, uh, being, uh, even being at a dog fight, having anything to do with a dog fight, uh, you'll get tied up in the legal system real quick. And do your officers have, um, they can, can, they, can they arrest Individual technically, they can, but we don't. Okay. Uh, technically, they can, but we don't. If we need, if we need somebody arrested, we would contact local police. Um, but the state law gives us the authority to arrest. We just don't exercise that. I'm assuming your officers do testify in court. They do, um, And there have been situations, I believe, in Carroll County where um, there were, I thought there was a, some of famous situation of a pig on someone's property who was getting out and bothering other people, that type of thing, your officers would Well, any in enforcement for any of the laws about, uh, about uh, uh, animal restraint, uh, pigs, horses, cows, uh, the county law requires that uh, animals that are fenced, like livestock, that the fencing be appropriate to the animal that is fenced, uh, what is normally considered appropriate, and that it be well maintained. So yes, any animal uh, that's loose off the owner's property is an enforcement issue for our officers, with the exception of cats. There is no law about cats go wandering and being loose. If cats are destroying property, attacking people, things like that, there are laws. But in terms of just st strolling across your lawn, no, there's no laws. Well, there's a major problem with feral cats. Well, there is a major problem depending on who you're talking to. Some people don't think it's a major problem at all, you know, and some people do. Uh, so um, they, do, uh, they, they do congregate. There is a trap-neuter-release uh, ideology that's out there now. I tend to sort of agree with it. Um, it's kind of like uh, if you trap out anything, wild animals or feral cats, which are semi-wild, uh, they will fill back the niche. It's not like you're going to get rid of them altogether. Uh, but there are only so many that a particular area will support. And so if you trap, neuter, and release them, they've got the area filled. If you trap and just take them away, the area gets refilled and they keep bringing in intact animals that keep reproducing. So from a, a solving a situation, the trap, neuter, release seems to really resolve uh, a lot of uh, that turnover, the fighting of the animals, the yelling and screaming at night of the animals, and then certainly the reproduction and kitten problem. What, what is the Humane Society's involvement in feral cat issues? Uh, we have no involvement in feral cat issues. Um, you know, if people uh, trap cats and bring them to us, and they're uh, and they have a, 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 an ear tip, which they used to they used to notch the ears. 
which I guess was really cool, but you're like, you can't ask the cat, how'd that ear get notched, bud? Was that just a tough night on the town, or did somebody do that particularly? <laughs> uh, and now what they do is they do a flat top on the ear, and that makes it really nice because that's very identifiable and lets you know that that's just a neutered animal from a colony. And we know basically the people that are doing the, uh, have the colonies, so we can contact them. And a lot of times people will, uh, will trap those cats, not so much because they're doing any damage, but because they just are worried about them. They've just seen them. They hadn't seen them before. Uh, and, and so they'll trap them. So, uh, and if they are doing damage, if there is an issue, then usually the people that have, done the, that have the colonies working, they can talk to the people and see what's going on. And if it really is a problem, well, then maybe that's not the place a, a colony should be located. Is, is there a danger? Do they endanger the domestic cats? I mean, they, there's the cat leukemia and that type of thing out there. You know, you and I could get struck by lightning while we're having this conversation. Uh, you know, so could they possibly ever in any circumstances? Of course they could, you know. But the raccoons out there can give your the raccoons have dog and cat distemper, you know. Uh, so uh, they're endangering your animals more than anything else, and we certainly don't want to eliminate all the raccoons. Uh, all of your neighbor's unvaccinated pets are endangering your animals more than probably the feral cats are. Um, uh, feral cats don't usually get near people, so they're not apt to bite or scratch your kids. Anybody's unvaccinated cat can get rabies. And, uh, and that's, you know, cats are probably the most dangerous thing for rabies because cats routinely scratch people and routinely bite kids because kids never pick up a cat all at one time. I mean, you know, and they don't know how to act around them. So if you've got a cat in the neighborhood that is, everybody knows that cat bites kids. And today he bit Joe. And everybody knows, well, Joe, what did you touch the cat for? You know the cat bites kids. And then 10 minutes later, the cat gets hit by a car and gets squished. And then the parents go out and they bury the cat. But this time, that unvaccinated cat bit Joe because that cat had rabies. And everybody just thinks it's the same old cat. And then little Joe not getting any treatments. And guess what? So, you know, people's domestic cats that are very friendly, that are unvaccinated, which is probably half the cats out there, that's the danger, not the feral cat. You mean society get, get involved in wild animals at all? We do. If uh, you're eating dinner and a raccoon falls down the chimney and gets in your living room and disturbs you a little bit, you can call us. Uh, if you wake up in the middle of the night with a bat in your bedroom, we'll be there. Uh, we'll contact you first, talk to you about the bat, uh, uh, how you feel about that bat, and if you feel like you might want to release it. Uh, if you think it has been in the house with anybody, it's been sleeping. If you think there is any chance in this world that rat, that bat could have been with a sleeping person or a little toddler or a small child, then it needs to be tested for rabies because you cannot see a bat bite. You would be very hard pressed to ever notice that you've been bitten by a bat. And they do carry rabies. Uh, less than one half of 1% of them in this area at any given time have rabies. It's not like the vampire bat out west, which is a real problem. We don't have a huge problem, but if you've been bitten, there's an issue. So we want to ascertain the situation. If you say, no, it's no way in this world it was with me, this is, it wasn't here last night, and it's in the kitchen right now, and you want to turn off the lights in the kitchen and turn on the outside lights and open the door and let him follow the draft and the lights out, then he'll go out. But some people don't want to. So we will respond on bats in, in the in, house. In the house. Because there's, well, yeah. there's, there's general knowledge that the bats are, are protected by federal law. So they you're, are. You're not supposed, if, they, if they get in your attic, for example, you just mm. can't go ahead and kill them. No, you can, and you can't exclude them. You can't, there's only a couple of months in the year, and I can't tell you right now what those months are. But uh, other than that, if you have more than 10 bats in your attic, you can't exclude them without permission from the Department of Natural Resources. So you have to let them remain in your attic? Until the proper month. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, if there's more than 10. If there's one, no. You know. But if there's more than 10, they're, that, that it, because they are endangered uh, and they are so beneficial. The average bat eats 5,000 insects a night. Wow, can you imagine? It's kind of like I, I heard something one time that said if every spider in the world disappeared tomorrow, mankind would last for about three weeks. That's how many insects they eat, which would eat all of our food if they weren't out there. And if they, it's not our food, it would be the food that the animals we eat eat. So it just filters down. So everybody thinks, oh, well, it's no big deal. It's just this. There, there are over 1,000 spiders in an uncultivated acre of ground. <laughs> Makes you want to go for a walk in the woods, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> or, or just get friendly with a lot of bats. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but if someone had a skunk in their backyard, you wouldn't come out no. to get rid of that. No, if they had a skunk stumbling around the backyard, we would. Because it may be rabbit. It may be rabbit. But just a skunk walking around. People say, oh, I just saw a raccoon in my backyard in the middle of the day. There must be something bad. 
And they get that information from a lot of strange places. You get it from people that should know better. Every Walt Disney film you've ever watched in your life has a raccoon and it was not shot at midnight. Uh, they do come out. I watch Fox and raccoons out at the Humane Society out in the fields all the time. Being out is not an issue. Being out and stumbling around, being out and approaching you, being out and uh, chasing your dog, those are things that are an issue. Now, uh, then we would need a phone call. Because most animals avoid human beings. Well, yeah. Yeah, although they've gotten pretty used to us because we feed them in the backyard, uh, because they raid our trash cans now that all smell, you know. Used to be, if you wanted to catch a fox, you had to, you had to dip the trap, you had to wear sh things on your boots so they wouldn't smell your feet, you had to have special gloves, and you no know, could smell any people. Now, you take a box trap out, you get it from the Humane Society, it's had 18 cats in it before that time, you throw in a piece of Kentucky Fried Chicken and you catch a fox because they're used to us. So are they as afraid as they used to be? No. But do they come up and say hi? They shouldn't. Over the, the last couple of years, there's been all, uh, all these instances of bear and that type of animal coming mm -hmm. into areas they've never oh, been yeah. into before. Oh, yeah. Do we have that problem in Carroll County? We do. We have bears in Carroll County almost every year. Uh, Shaladon Golf Course a couple of years had one that was visiting there for a while. Um, uh, the, uh, we had one down on Littlestown Pike for a while. Um, we get them every year. Uh, usually they're males. Uh, usually they're uh, probably two years old. Uh, they generally would weigh 250 pounds or so, uh, and mom has kicked them out. They're like, well, where should I go now? And they just follow the streams and the berries and come down, and they go back. Uh, and they generally are not a threat to anybody. Uh, you, it's against the law to shoot them. Um, and um, These are black bears. They're black. Oh, yes. We have no grizzlies. <laughs> we have black bears. And black bears, you know, uh, they're generally pretty, pretty cool. They're not generally going to bother you, you know. How about lynxes or uh, not jaguars, but uh, yeah, we have in bobcats. a family, bobcats. We have bobcats, and they're protected also. You can't shoot bobcats. Um, that being said, any wild animal that's attacking you, uh, that's another story. But just beca because they're there, you can't. And any, uh, any mountain lion, if you will, uh, that is that brownish gray in color, you can't shoot that either. Now, if you have a black one or one of the big stripes that's normally called the tiger, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, and occasionally, well, you know, I had a lady come in one time to the Humane Society. She said, she called me. She said, I have a picture of an animal, and I don't know what it was. We saw it on the side of the road. Can you tell me what it is? I said, well, I don't know, but I'd love to see your picture. She comes in. She gives me the picture, and I'm like, oh, my God. I said, when did you take the picture? She said, last fall. I said, and you waited until now to bring this in because... She wanted to finish the role. You know how people are. And I'm like, oh, but geez. She said, well, what is it? I said, it's an orangutan. And I'm like, not only was it an orangutan, it was a pretty big orangutan. And, I, and I, we didn't get any calls on it. I don't know why it was where it was. It was over in New Windsor on a dirt road while they were just driving around. They saw it. So whether it fell off of a little truck or something that had something to do with a sh circus or whether somebody had one illegally. I don't know whatever happened to it. We never got a call on it, but that's exactly what it was, and there was no mistake in it. Well, that leads me to ask the question about this whole idea about uh, people uh, uh, having exotic animals for mm -hmm. pets mm -hmm. as if they're trophies. Um, yeah. well, what, what is your opinion about that? Well, you know, we all have an ego, every one of us. Uh, the clothes we wear... Uh, don't I look like an ego maggot? No. The, the clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the houses we live in, uh, the people we hang out with, you know, we all are out there trying to, to put on a big show for people and, and to, at one extreme or one extent to another. And uh, exotic animals are just another avenue of that. Uh, I've got a tiger in the kitchen. How'd you like to see that? Wow, you got a tiger in the kitchen? All of a sudden, you're a real big deal. Um, and you might also like tigers, but it's still that whole big deal, I've got a tiger routine. And then after all your friends, and all your relatives and all the neighbors have seen the tiger, then you just have a tiger. And, uh, and then all that newness and the, all that stuff wears away, and then the tiger grows up. Most wild animals are friendly to the extent that they would be with their mothers. When they get to the age that they would leave their moms, some that's a year, some that's two years, some that might be five or six, when they would leave their moms, they don't have any use for you anymore, and they become wild animals. Um, uh, I don't care. You, people like, well, Siegfried and Roy spent all their available moments with those big cats, and in, one of them almost killed him. Now, he went quite a while before that happened, but it's the inevitable. It is going to happen. You get eaten by a wild animal, or, or you get attacked or killed. Uh, so in Maryland, it is against the law to own big cats. It's against the law to own big, dangerous animals. Uh, you, some of these uh, hybrid cats, um, like the, uh, I can't even think the names of this, there's several different names of the ones they've got out there now. As long as they're no more than 20 pounds, 
I think 30, maybe 30 pounds. Uh, they're legal in the state. I wouldn't suggest anybody get them because there's just... They, they jump up on mantle pieces. I mean, they, there's nothing sacred in your house if you get those animals. They, they like to be up high rather than low. So uh, they, they're, just, they're just destructive. Uh, they don't make great pets for the most part. How about monkeys and snakes? Uh, poisonous snakes are illegal in the state of Maryland. Uh, I don't know why anybody thinks they need a reticulated python. <laughs> if you need a 23-foot snake, I mean, I don't know why. But, but that's not know, illegal, though. It's not illegal. And fortunately, people are not, well, fortunately for the people and not so fortunately for the snakes, they don't have the, uh, the ability to keep them alive long enough to get as big as they could get. But there's no place to put them once you get those big snakes. And, uh, and, and same thing with iguanas. I mean, you know, an iguana is a, it's a cool little animal, but pretty soon it needs its own room. You know, so if you don't have a room for the iguana, you know, if you've ever seen an iguana poo, it's a pool of poo about this big, you know. It's, a, it's not, all these animals have issues. You know, even the big parrots, they'll, all your, all your uh, 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 molding around your doors and your windows are going to be gone pretty soon. They'll chew all just one, one bite to get rid of those. So, uh, but big, dangerous exotics are illegal in the state of Maryland. And monkeys of all types are illegal in the state of Maryland. Other people still have monkeys. Uh, they'll bring them in from outside the state until the authorities find out about it, and then they'll have to do something else with them. Now, uh, the Humane Society is not a no-kill facility. We are an open admission facility, and when you are an open admission facility, it's pretty much impossible unless you're in a community that has gotten so serious about no-kill that everything, in other words, unless county government has started to fund trap, neuter, release, making sure all the cats are spayed and neutered. Some communities, they're doing that. Uh, and they are getting rid of a huge animal population problems. But as long as people continue to breed and continue to uh, get puppies and not treat them, or, or not treat them, not train them, so they bring us the juvenile delinquents, so to speak. Uh, I love the people that bring the dog in that's a, you know, a year old, and I'm thinking to myself, man, you're on the downhill slide. You know, you've, you've weathered this puppy, and now you've got this adult you're bringing me to go get another puppy. Uh, duh, you know. So nonetheless, uh, no kill. Those are facilities that are, we call them, we don't like to call them no kill, because they're still part of the problem. I mean, you know, uh, when they turn their backs on people that come to them with the uh, unruly uh, dog with, uh, with medical problems, uh, they inadvertently send them to us. All right, they're taking in three or four hundred animals a year, maybe only a hundred animals a year, maybe only sixty animals a year. We're taking in over five thousand. Uh, they can find homes for their few. We can't find homes for our masses. Uh, I will, that being said, right now we are fortunately being able to place every well socialized, friendly dog that we get into the shelter. Uh, unless it's got like medical problems that's going to cost people hundreds of dollars a month. Uh, the citizens, generally speaking, don't, don't want that. Anybody that ever sees this, if they do, call. We'll put you on the list. Uh, but every friendly, nice dog that comes into our shelter finds a home. So what is your policy about euthanizing? If it's not a friendly, nice dog uh, that you would want to live or I would want to live next door to, it gets euthanized. So it's not, it's not just a matter of you have too many dogs or too many Not cats. anymore. It used to be. When I first came there, we would, uh, and I don't mean that I solved this problem. I didn't. The community solved this problem, and we've helped them. But uh, when, when I first came there in 1982, yeah, you, there, wasn't, there wasn't a week that went by that you didn't have, because an animal shelter has to have room for the dogs that are lost or, uh, or that you're trying to find the owners for. So the adoptions are secondary to an animal control program. So we would go back and have to decide which dogs we're going to have to euthanize to make space for the ones that were coming in the front door. We do not have to do that anymore. Uh, we had to do that almost about eight months ago. And everybody looked at each other. My staff was like, whoa. But they haven't been there. They haven't seen what I've seen. And I'm like, all right, we'll find out how. We can, we can manage this because we're only talking about a couple here. So uh, we can do it. So we don't have that problem. Cats, on the other hand, yeah, we still have to euthanize for space. And cats have... So many upper respiratory diseases, and even the shots that they get only protect them from about a third of them. And so when you bring in cats from unknown origins together all the time, the upper respiratory is just, oh, it's just awful. We've gotten much better. We've got, we're battling it right this moment at the shelter, but we've gotten much better in our, the procedures that we use. Uh, because we were using procedures that you would use for individual animals, and there's a veterinarian by the, doctor, by the name of Dr. Kate Hurley that's at UC Davis in California that is the guru for shelters now. She is the go-to person. She has a website for shelters. And she said all these well-meaning veterinarians, of which we had had many come, and they said to us, we don't know what you could do because you're just doing everything we can imagine. What we found out was those veterinarians don't deal in herd medicine. 
And when you're dealing with cats at a shelter, you're talking herd medicine. So it's a whole different field, and we've been able to do better. But, but still, you get one that comes in that's got something that everybody else gets, and then you're just, oh, it's awful. It's the worst thing in the world. And people drop their animals off a lot of times because they're older, mm-hmm. and they don't, want to, they don't want to go through the... I guess the pain or whatever of actually mm-hmm. euthanizing them themselves. Mm-hmm. They do. Well, they bring them in specifically for euthanasia. Oh, okay. And, uh, and it's cheaper to bring them to us than to take them to the veterinarian. Um, and, uh, and so that's okay. You know, uh, as long as people don't let their animals suffer, I don't care exactly why it is. They're, they're bringing them to different places. But, uh, yeah, we'll accommodate them if we can. How has the economy affected the uh, number of animals dropped off at your facility? We are getting a few more. It's not humongous. Uh, it's not overwhelming, uh, but we are getting a few more, and, uh, and it does not seem to have a, uh, affected our adoption rates at this point, but we are in a fairly affluent community, in a fairly stable community, which is, that's one of the reasons I think we're not seeing the repercussions. Uh, what are the biggest challenges that you have and that the Humane Society has running this uh, facility on a day-to-day basis? Well... I think the challenge is just to do the job that the public expects of you, uh, to be able to um, explain to the public why you do some of the things that you do, because why should they know? (laughs) Uh, They're not involved in the volume and the numbers uh, uh, that we get. Uh, Basically, one of the hardest things is negotiating or solving neighborhood problems. Individual disputes, uh, Mr. Smith's dog's running loose, uh, he's getting ready to get a citation because it's run loose before. Mrs. Jones has a rose garden and the dog's been digging them up. She's got prize roses and she loves them. And now she knows that you're going to give Mr. Smith a $50 fine. Hmm. She's real unhappy because she thinks this dog has just a nuisance and $50. What the heck is that? And Mr. Smith's really ticked off because, you know, goodness, they're just roses, for heaven's sakes. I'll buy her another bush, you know, maybe. Uh, So you have two people now that are mad at us because we're not servicing either one the way they think they need to be serviced. So trying to walk that line. And then, God forbid, one or both of them calls the county commissioners and is angry. Well, they're politicians. (laughs) Now they're upset because they've got constituents that are upset about a service that they're funding. So you've got all three of them now to balance. Um, then you have a homeowners association. So it's well, you just, it's just everything. It's just everything. And, and people don't talk to each other anymore. Uh, people aren't willing to work out their own problems. Uh, the state's attorney's office has, uh, has allowed us uh, to use their negotiators, uh, their mediators. And we try and ask people to do that. Some will do it, some won't. Sometimes it's just a question of talking to your neighbor. I had a dog that kept tearing up my trash. And I prepared, and he was there every week. And I didn't fuss at him and yell at him because I didn't really want to make him where he wouldn't come to me. And he was a nice dog. Sure did tear up the trash. So I went down with my note one day on my stapler. And I, hi there, how are you? Whatever your name is. Come here, come here. He came over, and I took my note, and I wrapped it around his collar, and I stapled it. And I sent it home with him. Took his note back to his owner. I don't know who you are, but this dog's tearing up my trash. And I really wish you'd keep him home. And if next Wednesday he's not at home... You might want to call Harry County Animal Control. And I never saw the dog again. I sent him home with a note to his parents. <laughs> and they responded. Would that so many people do that? Be that nice. They were very responsible. They probably didn't have an idea what he was doing. They took care of it. Uh, I hope they didn't give him away. I hope he's not chained up in the backyard and with you know not having a, a decent life. I don't know where he is, but he's not in my trash. So we ask people to do that type of thing. So just it's just that balancing act. Uh, you get you get ten calls at the, at the end of the day. I don't have the funding to pay the overtime, and unless it's a vicious animal getting ready to attack somebody, I'm not, I'm not spending it. Or if it's an animal that's injured, the owner is unknown on the highway, something that we've really got to take care of. We're on call 24-hour days for emergencies. Uh, your emergency might not rise to the level of an emergency that I'm going to pay time, double time or time and a half for people to come out. Um, if the county wants to fund me for shift work, uh, I, I have no problem with having shifts of animal control officers. But my people are asleep at night. And when you call with that bat in your bedroom, they're sleeping. And they've got to come to work the next day. But they will come to your house and help you out. Or they will certainly call you on the phone and talk to you. Now, are they going to call everybody that calls us in the middle of the night? No. Are they going to call everybody that calls on Sunday when we're closed? They certainly are not. We have an answering service that does that. 
Uh, will people be totally satisfied with the answering service? Maybe not. They're not my employees. They do change hands. They do have basic policies. Um, but Carroll County government is not prepared to give the citizens a full service 24-hour day animal control response team. And in my opinion, Carroll County citizens don't need it. And I see no reason for spending money, taxpayers' monies, on things that are not needed. With the continual growth of uh, the population in Carroll County, how, what do you see the future of the Humane Society being? Well, I think the Humane Society will continue to uh, grow along with the county, uh, and that's, like I said, dependent on what they want us to do. Uh, if they're satisfied with what we're doing uh, for the money that they're paying us, then we will. We might need more officers because as the community grows, you know, people don't realize they say, "Well, oh, you guys don't handle that many calls." Well, we do, but if you look at the paperwork that's involved, it's not like we're going to write a ticket and then hand that ticket off to somebody and that's the end of what we do. We've got to follow up on the ticket. We've got to call the citizens. We've got to see what their intent is. We've got to fill out a statement of charges. Then we have to, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, there's a lot involved. An officer comes in in the morning. Just through the officers. Comes in in the morning. He has phone calls that people have called. They're on his machine. He's got to call those people back. Of course, they're not always where they're supposed to be when we need them, and then we've got to call them back some more. And then he has, to, uh, he has to look at the calls that he's got. He has to write the reports that he has. He has to go out in his truck that he answers the calls for the day. He may have an animal that needs to get to a hospital or needs to get back into the shelter that he's got to still go back out to where he was, come back in. He's got to fill out his reports. He's got to check in the animals. He's got to wash out his vehicle. <laughs> and then he's got to answer his phone calls. So you can't handle a ton of calls during the day. So um, when we have more calls, then we may have to have more officers. You know, it's, 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 it's a, I have some of the best people, and they do work hard, you know. They, and I don't ask for funding from the county if I don't need it. Uh, and I think busy employees are happy employees. I don't think stressed employees are happy, but I think busy is good. And I was just getting ready to ask for an additional person, and this economy, <laughs> you know, went up what it did. And, of course, if people are watching this 20 years from now, believe me, 2010 was a bad year. <laughs> But uh, it, you, you just do what you can do, and you try your best. Well, thank you for your time today. I, I appreciate it. you coming here. Yeah, absolutely. It's fun to talk to you. Thank you.